Join us at this important announcement, but time will, nobody then. Now, the Conservative Party has been a staunch supporter of Ukraine. In 1991, it was a Conservative government that was the first Western country to recognize Ukrainian independence. In 2008, our Conservative government was the first country to recognize the Holodomor as a genocide when it passed by private members bill. Our relationship was strengthened and our resolve was deepened after Russia's illegal invasion and their illegal annexation of Ukraine's sovereign territory in 2014. Now, as a government, conservatives responded quickly and forcibly to support Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. We placed wide-ranging sanctions on individuals responsible for the illegal annexation of Crimea. We provided hundreds of millions of dollars in diplomatic, economic, and military aid. And we began the negotiations for the defense cooperation arrangement and the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. As a result of our unwavering support, 13 politicians and officials were banned from entering Russia. Andrew Scheer, Ted Opitz, and myself are all included on that list. I know I speak on behalf of both Andrew and Ted when I say that this ban is actually a badge of honor. It has only strengthened our determination to stand up for Canadian values on the, Canadian, on the international stage and in Ukraine. And it was a Conservatives who championed the Sergei Maninsky Law in Parliament just last month. And it is Conservatives who are calling on Canada to restore the um, provisions of radar sat images back to Ukraine, or put Ukraine on the automatic firearms country control list, and to supply Ukraine with lethal defensive weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the leader of the official opposition, the Honorable Andrew Scheer, who's going to make an important announcement about Canada's role on the international stage. Andrew. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a special uh, greetings to uh, the Ukrainian uh, Consul General, His, His Excellency Andrei Veselovsky. Uh, good to know that you're here. Uh, I want to thank Ted Opitz uh, and Anton, uh, who put this all together. Thank you very much for bringing the Ukrainian community uh, together. I want to thank uh, James for uh, his leadership. I can tell you I've worked with James. We were both elected in the class of 2004, and his commitment and his passion for standing up, uh, not just for the Ukrainians here in Canada, but for Ukraine itself on the world stage. Uh, his private member's bill on the Holodomor, uh, his leadership getting the Magnitsky Act through. Uh, it's been tremendous to be able to work with him in Shadow Cabinet, and he's been a strong voice for this community. I, I really do appreciate all that he's done uh, for the community and for uh, the opposition. So uh, we are fortunate today to be hosted by uh, Plash, the Ukrainian scouting organization, a group which has given so much to the upbringing of Ukrainian Canadian youth as proactive citizens and future leaders of the community and of Canada. So I'm here today, this afternoon, to update you on the role Canada's Conservatives see our Canadian Armed Forces playing in a possible peacekeeping deployment to be chosen by the government. Now the Trudeau Liberals have been promising to choose a mission since they took office, but after two years, they appear to be no closer to a decision. They made great promises to our allies and then left them waiting. From day one, Conservatives have been clear. Any deployment has to be in Canada's national interests. This possible peacekeeping mission is not a means to win a seat at the UN Security Council at any cost. Any deployment of Canadian soldiers as peacekeepers must be consistent with our interests our values, and in keeping with our greatest traditions of offering a hand to those seeking peace, freedom, and security. This is why a future Conservative government will advocate for and lead Canadian participation in a United Nations peacekeeping mission in eastern Ukraine in accordance with the requests made by the Ukrainian government. Since the Ukrainian people made their historic choice at the Maidan in 2014, Ukraine has faced illegal armed aggression and the seizure of its territory by Vladimir Putin's regime. Canada responded to these acts of Russian aggression with a determination exceeding that of any other country in the world. Our previous Conservative government imposed the widest set of personal and sectoral sanctions of any Western country 
offered significant non-lethal military aid and began, and began Operation Unifier, a Canadian Armed Forces training mission for the Ukrainian military. And Putin got the message. Like a number of my friends here today, James mentioned, I am on the Russian blacklist because of our strong stand. And like James and Ted, I wear being on that list as a badge of honor. But under the Trudeau Liberals, Canada has failed to respond to Russian aggression with meaningful action. Canada lo no longer provides critical radar sat intelligence to the Ukrainian military, and the Liberal government has lagged behind the United States in imposing sanctions on Russian human rights abusers under the Magnitsky Act, a law the Liberals opposed and stalled for the first year of their mandate. It was only because of leadership from the Conservative Party that this bill finally became law. Well, it's time for Canada to lead again. That's why Conservatives want to see Canadian leadership in a peacekeeping mission in eastern Ukraine. This mission would cover the entire Donbass region in Ukraine, necess necessitating the withdrawal of the Russian military and its proxies from U Ukrainian territory. It must exclude Russian participation, as Russia is the aggressor in the conflict. It would allow Ukraine to restore control over its eastern border with Russia, ensuring the Russian military stays within its own country and out of Ukraine. Though this conflict has receded from the headlines, it is by no means over. More than 10,000 Ukrainians have lost their lives, and one and a half million have been displaced from their homes. The economy of Donbass lies in ruins, its towns and cities emptied of people. Crimea, annexed illegally, at the, state, at the start of the conflict, remains a brutal police state where opponents of the Russian regime are arbitrarily imprisoned or even made to disappear entirely. But after almost four years of war, Ukrainians have not given in. Ukraine is still fighting for its independence, its freedom, and its right to determine its own destiny. The defense of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity from Vladimir Putin's illegal acts of aggression should be a priority for Canada's government on the international stage. It is a goal compatible with a peacekeeping role for Canada in this region. The request has been made directly by Ukraine to the Prime Minister, and now it is time to act. Thank you very much. I have to take your questions now. Mr. Shear, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very important announcement and as well to your shadow cabinet and to the entire Conservative Caucus for bringing this very important issue uh, forward. Um, as a retired Canadian military officer, I'm traveling to the front lines very often in the bus delivering humanitarian aid and I exactly repeat what you say here, that it's a very important situation, it's very grave and it's not going to resolve itself unless the Western country take a leadership, uh, leadership stance. And just about three weeks ago, I was testifying in front of the Standing Committee of National Defense on this very issue, and I brought forward the issue of the UN peacekeeping mission, so I'm very pleased that you're making this announcement today. Uh, my only concern is, is as we all know, Mr. Putin doesn't play by the same rules we play here in the West. Mr. Putin's already talking about a peacekeeping mission uh, his own way, and uh, it's a very dangerous situation because as we see, for example, with the OECE, a very credible organization, important mission, as I can tell you once again, seeing it in the Donbass, uh, Mr. Putin is using OEC to his advantage to distort the situation even, even further. So my concern would be uh, that Mr. Putin can start playing along with the Western uh, leaders uh, in terms of the UN mission uh, and at the same time trying to achieve his strategic goals. So what would be your response? How would you see it? How do we counter this possible uh, counter proposal from Mr. Putin? What do we do about it? Mm. Well, thank you very much for the question. I, I certainly do agree with your premise that uh, the Putin regime does not play along the same rules as, as other, uh, certainly Western democracies and, and, our, and our allies. We, we see that right from the get-go, the, the, uh, the fact that it was involved with the uh, invasion and annexation in the first place is a, a clear sign of, of, uh, of Putin's mindset on this. But I do believe that uh, while he, he, his regime and, and Russia itself may try to uh, maneuver and, and try to influence the, these types of things, that when our allies show resolve and determination and force. We can force the Putin regime to change their tactics and to come closer to where we want them to be. So let me be very clear. Our proposal would not be 
uh, in any way uh, compatible with Putin's proposal. This is not uh, allowing him to dictate the terms. Uh, this is standing by the Ukrainian government's call for the peacekeeping to start at the, uh, at the border, not at the site of, uh, of the conflicts, but at the border to give people in that region, in Crimea, in these regions, uh, in fact, liberate them from, uh, from Russian control. So uh, I understand that it's always, these things are difficult, but that's why we're calling on Canada to show some leadership here. We only improve the, the situation. We only force these types of regimes to back down uh, or to make concessions when we have a strong show of force and determination. And that's something we just haven't been seeing under this Liberal government. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Bandera, 4TV. Um, uh, Ukraine aside for a moment, uh, Russia, uh, does it, Russia pose any threat militarily or otherwise to Canada, to us here, especially Uh, well, uh, let, me, let me say that I believe that Russia's uh, interests uh, have been shown to be uh, in competition with, with our interests, that they're, they're not in parallel, that uh, we, we want uh, strong, independent countries in Eastern Europe. We want uh, people in Eastern Europe to be able to live freely and choose their own governments and to uh, fulfill their own destiny. And we see time and time again uh, the Putin regime uh, interfering in that. So in that sense, I do believe that uh, uh, Russia does pose a, th a threat to regional security, which has an impact uh, on Canada. Uh, I will leave it to the uh, U.S. authorities to navigate through the various allegations there. I won't pretend to know uh, the ins and outs of that. And I have not been made aware of incidences or allegations in Canada. But on cybersecurity, uh, I do believe that this is going to be a serious threat in the 21st century, where we have other regimes around the world and countries that do not share our same values, do not say, share our same goals of peace and, and mutual cooperation, and use s state entities uh, to, uh, to, to, to further their, their regime's uh, interests. Uh, it's a big concern, whether it's hackers, individuals, organized crime, uh, or foreign states that have diametrically opposed intentions and, and values as we have. We need, a, we need the government to take public security seriously and include cybersecurity as part of that. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that as well, because um, we do have in front of the uh, parliament right now Bill C-59, which we will start uh, debating uh, when we get back from Remembrance Day uh, break week uh, in the ridings. And Bill C-59 actually, the one part of the, of the bill I, I, I think we'll, we'll be supporting is it does provide for cyber security, cyber defense mm -hmm. and cyber offense, uh, which is the first time in Canadian history. And so uh, not happy with how some of the things are being changed with communication security establishment um, and, and um, bringing it out from underneath national defense. That, that's, uh, I think, a concern for all of us. But um, th there is pieces in that legislation that we'll be able to support and we'll be requesting amendments on, on some of the other sections of the bill. Uh, and the other thing that to, to keep in mind is you, know, you ask about uh, Russia as a threat. Uh, there, there, there's no doubt that what we're seeing in, in Europe it transpires to all NATO members, and Canada's proud to be a NATO member. And when you uh, ask you know, generals that come to committee from time to time at, at National Defense, and I ask them, you know, are we at all concerned about uh, Russia coming over the Arctic in, into our, our, our airspace. Definitely, it happens all the time. We're always scrambling our CF-18s to intercept Russian bears and, and other uh, Russian aircraft as they approach our, our airspace. But will they ever come as a, as a ground attack? You know, if they do, then we'll be sending up our SARTEX to save them. <laughs> My name is Lisa Shimko. I am chair and I'm on the board of several not-for-profits in Ukraine and in Canada. Um, I wanted to ask you a question that's somewhat related to what is going on in the States and the entire Trump-Russia scandal. There are so many reports on concerns about the number of shell companies that <coughs> managed to get registered in states such as Delaware. I'm just wondering, there have been so many articles in Canada written about how the, Canada is supposedly a haven for a lot of foreign shell companies that register here. How confident are you that the Magnitsky Act and any subsequent legislation after that will be able to tighten 
um, those loopholes that still exist. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll maybe let James go into the, the details of the Magnitsky Act because he was so uh, instrumental in its passing. But I, I do believe that the tools that are in there will help. Uh, obviously, every time governments do things to, to protect against the, these types of activities, other states and other entities try to figure out ways around it. So in some ways, it's, it, governments have to be nimble and, and constantly evaluating uh, how the, the new threats are approaching itself. But the, the proof to me that, that the Magnitsky Act is meaningful is how vigorously Russia opposes it. And that, to me, tells, tells us that we're on the right track and that it is a, a valuable tool. The previous Conservative government brought in a lot of uh, things to help track money, uh, whether it was FinTrack or whether it was signing agreements with other countries to uh, share information when we think that suspicious activity uh, is going on. And so, you know, I believe that Canadians want to make sure that our elections are decided by Canadians. Uh, there are other aspects of, of, of not so much state involvement, but groups that were involved in the last election using foreign funding to pay for advocacy groups here in Canada that went out to campaign and influence uh, uh, voters along different issues. That's something that a lot of Canadians have raised with concerns about me, that we're okay having debates in this country along pipelines, along energy development, along uh, municipal issues. Vigorous debate is great, but Canadians should be deciding that, and Canadians should be uh, involved in the conversation. And the idea that foreign groups, international groups, pump a lot of money into Canada uh, to help influence those decisions upsets a lot of Canadians that I've spoken to. On, on the issue of, of Magnitsky, one thing that, that uh, was strengthened in the bill, uh, and I think uh, Senator Reno undertook for, for making sure it was in there, is that we have the uh, ability to identify any foreign money coming in and compel financial institutions to disclose it. So uh, this is a big improvement over what was originally proposed uh, a few years ago by uh, Mr. Kotler. And so this actually gives us the, the tools we need. So CSIS, the RCMP, other policing agencies, uh, and the Department of Foreign Affairs can actually seize those assets that are uh, begotten from illicit means. So for those individuals that are gross human rights violators or corrupt foreign officials, uh, and they're trying to shelter their money and use Canada's safe haven, uh, that, that will be stopped under this new system. Okay. Maybe time for one more question, if anybody else has um, it. I will ask um, Nurse Alvin, Dr. Rosa Mehta. Um, I want to go back to your proposal, and uh, could you please clarify what exactly you are proposing in your, uh, in your whatever, resolution or how, what kind of documents, because it's not clear when the UN would agree on any kind of mission, and if they would agree on the mission, would the Canada be taking a leading role? How, how is this supposed to be worked out? So what we are saying today is that uh, a Conservative government in 2019 uh, would support the call for a UN peacekeeping mi mission along the lines of the Ukrainian request, not the Russian proposal, which we know uh, serves the purpose of uh, Putin's regime and does not serve the purpose of, of, U of Ukraine or, U or Ukrainians who are trapped in the, in the conflict zone. So that's the first key point. The second key point is to say that this is what we, you know, we are calling for this leadership right now. Obviously, we, uh, there are elements at the UN that, that Canada can't control, uh, but we believe firmly that when Prime Minister Stephen Harper and Canada had a strong voice and a strong message and was fierce in our determination that Canada could play a leadership role in forcing Putin to change his tactics or to make concessions. Uh, and we don't see that now. Uh, in quite the opposite, as, as we mentioned some examples of Canada pulling back from some of its support for Ukraine with, with really no explanation given. So that's the, the point of this message today is to say that Conservatives will lead on this, that we will t make Canada have that leadership position again and be that stronger voice. Because I, I truly do believe that Vladimir Putin responds to force. He, he responds to a concerted, united, front with our allies and uh, right now we are we are disappointed as a party that the liberal government has ceded its leadership position in this area and a conservative government 2019 would bring canada back thank you very much that'll conclude it's, it's not a question yeah. <coughs> i'm sorry we're going to have president of canadian association of canadian Tatars. Uh, one thing uh, james did mention that the conservatives uh, were the initiators of the bill C-306, uh, which would recognize Crimean, uh, genocide of Crimean mm -hmm. Tatars, deportation mm -hmm. of Crimean Tatars in 1944 as a genocide 
I'd like to say thank you for everything you're doing for Crimean Tatars and for Ukraine and uh, for uh, being uh, such as for advocating our rights. So you know what the situation now in Crimea and uh, you need your help. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that feedback. And thank you very much for being here and allowing us to make this announcement here and look forward to chatting with you one-on-one -on -one now. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ted.